Hello, testing one, two, three, episode audiobooks. Um. Hello, and welcome to On the Same Page, a podcast in which two mates separated by oceans and hemispheres talk about books and catch each other up on life between the lines. Unfortunately, we can't get together in person, but through this podcast, we hope to get on the same page. Welcome back to On the Same Page. I am Seamus, and with me, as always, is Blake. Howdy. And today, we're talking about audiobooks. Um, mm-hmm. Now you've listened to a lot more audiobooks than I have, so you're probably a better, better source of information on these sorts of things. But what I guess, what makes a good audiobook, in your opinion? Oh yeah, that's there's a lot to think about. I think firstly, there's a distinction to be made between dramatizations mm. and straight narration. I haven't really made a distinction here. I've, I've got uh, at least one or two of. I think I've got definitely one dramatization mm, mm. or, you know, like a full cast performance. Yes. Um, I think both are acceptable. I think the great thing I do love an audiobook, um, and, you know, spend a lot of time traveling and on the move and in com in commuting. So I have devoured a lot of these. Yep. I like to re-listen to books, especially classics that I might've pumped through at a time where I wasn't maybe ready for them mm-hmm. and then listening to them again. I think also it's great that, you know, you get um, a reading from either a great actor and a great narrator just in a different voice. You get a whole different landscape of what the book was. Um, then your first impression. And and, uh, and then again, you can just have these amazing dramatizations or theatre productions or BBC productions where you get a full cast yeah. um, to tell. You know, there's so many that I could have... Vanity Fair is one that comes to mind. Um in search of lost time there's so many great mm. retellings uh and dramatizations some of them are kind of full casts and some of them are, are shorter theatrical productions yep they're all good i think yeah, it doesn't really matter too much um but in terms of what i think is a good one it's just i think whether it 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 um it uh vindicates its own existence by being slightly its own thing compared to just a straight reading i think some of the worst audiobooks are some of the most dire ones is just i mean i won't name any names but there's certain production houses particularly in america that you just have like this very old dude just speaking welcome to the reading of this book and then yeah it's like, okay you, then they just flatly read it in a, in a monotonous tone for the whole time mm. you really need a great actor and a great reader to have a whole cast of voices to find an individual uh, tone and camber um, and timbre for for and cadence for you know every different character really brings something alive if the book is good enough to to warrant those and that's what I think I love about it just hearing another great artist come to a book and add to it and make it something new and also if, if like sometimes they add production value through uh, adding music through adding mm. background. Mm. Uh, background noise scenes yep. you know if sailing if they're on a ship and yep. there's a bit of yep. uh, ocean noise of the seagulls or you know just producing a whole audible perf- performance um, mm. not to, not that audible is the only audiobook uh, distributor but they are a good one they are uh, so yeah I don't know I didn't have a particular like uh, criteria I was going to meet but just things that I loved and that I would um, listen to again mm. how about you well I guess it, it it's it's sort of one of those tough questions that am I loving this book because I'm loving the book or am I loving the book because of the way they're performing it and if I'd read this book on my own would I have the yeah. same experience would I be pausing where they're pausing would I be take it would I be taking in what they're putting out mm. kind of thing I guess that's sort of the distinction that you'll you'll never be able to know because you can never experience it again for the first time so i also didn't have a, a particular way of picking this list um i'm quite and new yet i am very books. picky 
and I and yet I am very picky with audiobooks. I mm. am a absolute um you know an annoyance to the help desk at Audible <laughs> constantly <laughs> refunding books that I've, you know, downloaded and then listened to a bit and been like, mm, no. Yeah. Uh, no, thank you. I don't like this. I don't like the narration. I don't like the how it's performed. Mm. I don't mm. like this voice. That, that isn't how I saw the characters. If I'm listening to something I've previously read, yep. Or if um, it just wasn't what I was in the mood for, because you def- definitely have to be in the mood um, for a particular book, because it is going to be going on inside your head a lot, and um, often, you know, unlike depending on how busy your life is. Sometimes you only get a small portion of a day in order to read a book and make progress. Mm. Where with an audiobook, you can you can crunch through the equivalent of fifty to one hundred pages a day, just in like a regular day of commuting and yeah, washing the dishes and Gardening, shaving anything. or whatever it is. Yeah. So, so you're really going to have an, an intimate, intense uh, experience with a book, uh, uh, and um, you know you want it to be uh, top tier. And I certainly, yeah, get very picky, but it's very much a vibe. Mm, I mm. very much uh, do a lot of my selecting just on, on vibe, what I feel like listening. Do I like the narrator? Yep. Do I like... I often listen to uh, books that I wouldn't normally listen to just because I've really liked the narration for yep. a different book um, and uh, found things that I wouldn't normally have listened to that way. Mm, mm. And yeah. So oh, I think you know, audiobooks are just a great, uh, I don't know, world onto themselves oh, they're very accessible they're definitely yeah but I, I, I very rarely listen to non-fiction mm. I usually listen to fiction most of the time I even listen to fiction that I've already read yeah um, because I you know I'm, I'm a person who likes to read and take notes and highlight mm. and things like Absolutely. that and, yeah and and you know and I can do that on my phone while I'm listening and stuff but you can't really do it very it's, it's hard uh, exactly and you know if, if you're reading something uh, you know, dense, uh, something very complicated. Um, you know, I'd rather just listen to something I can flow with as mm. I move about the world and that, you know, it's just a nice um, narration for my life that I'm enjoying being inside Yep. rather than, you know, so a, mo- a lot of the time I return books because I'm like, no, that needs to be, I need to read that. Yep. Yep. That's very true. Well, why don't you kick us off then? What was your... Well, my Numer- first choice yeah. is uh, definitely something I'd, I'd read before, definitely something I love, which is Sherlock Holmes by Arthur Conan Doyle, yep. read by on Stephen my list. Fry. All right, there we go. <laughs> <laughs> Great. We're starting off. There's number got, two like on Battleship. my list. <laughs> we both got it. Uh, yeah, I mean, I have... Re- I mean, I could... God, I mean, I don't know. Stephen Fry is a global treasure... I would mm. teabag a volcano just to hear him tell stories <laughs> through a walkie-talkie. <laughs> he, I, I've, I've listened to, I've read his books. I've listened to him narrate his books. I've listened to him narrate Douglas Adams. I've even listened to him narrate Shakespeare's sonnets. Mm-hmm. Obviously, Harry Potter. I haven't really listened to all of those, but I've listened to sections of his Harry Potter. And it's something I want to do one day. But I'm actually like, actually, I'm going to save that for when, uh, for when I have children or something like that. Yeah, yeah. My sister gave birth this year to uh flynn congratulations and i congratulations to hello Laura. flynn she, hello flynn as well if you ever listen to this <laughs> hi this is, i've never actually met you in person hi uh, <laughs> um but i know uh that they are you know as a baby they're listening to stephen fry's narration and mm, I commented mm. on a picture that she said saying if you if you're listening to i don't know who the american narration is there's another harry potter narration that's not by stephen fry if that you're putting that in my nephew's ears then i disown you as a sister and your offspring yep. <laughs> fair enough fair but enough. no she said she just sent a message back which i can now see in my phone uh it's definitely the stephen fry version we aren't heathens <laughs> good stuff good she's stuff. on the same Laura, page uh, she's on the same page here we go and yeah so i i, I mean it's 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 70 hours it's sherlock Holmes. i think it's 90 you get is it 90 hours? Yeah, I think when it's you 90. Get all the extra stuff. There was stuff in this narration that I hadn't read before. Mm. Um, you even get the longer versions, like you get the versions of the stories when, you know, they get, it's in like the, the American West and there's more. Oh, yeah, and stuff what's like that one? That. Is that I, a sign of four? Uh, I think that's a sign of four, but I had read like, I, I guess, like an abridged version because I'd never heard that before. But I'd never heard that either. Yeah. Somehow. 
So maybe I saw it, or I don't know why. I mm. mean, is Sherlock Holmes, there's so many mediums Sherlock Holmes is. There's the great um, Granada TV show. There's obviously the the films and the Robert Downey Juniors and, and the Benedict the Cumberbatch. Cumberbatch. But, um, which are all good. Love love all Sherlock Holmes content. Mm. But Stephen Fry, and Stephen Fry is, you know, he was one of the, I think, the youngest member of the Sherlock Holmes Society in London. And Damn. famously... He uh, got an exemption from school when he was a kid to go down to London to attend a Sherlock Holmes conference or something. Mm. And that's when he decided to take upon himself to steal credit cards and, uh, you know, like live up, live it up at the Savoy. And I think he eventually went to prison. Uh, oh. So uh, it all started with Sherlock. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> but um, yeah, uh, the uh, is it Anthony Brett who does the Jeremy uh, Brett? Granada television. Jeremy Brett. Jeremy Brett's amazing. Mm. I love Jeremy. There's a great interview with Jeremy Brett where he talks about how he performed Sherlock Holmes and just kind of showing these glimmers of, you know, glimmers of his like cracks through marble. I think mm. he described his Sherlock. Yeah. And I think Stephen Fry was also really wonderful in his retelling and in his narration because he managed to really capture that subliminal emotion, which is makes Sherlock Holmes so dynamic. And you know, mm. he's such a, a superficial sociopath but underneath there's always just this great heart to him and uh you know which is what watson kind of sees in him and things like that yeah yeah but the re- uh, it's just immaculate i loved uh every hour would listen to it again um i'd pro- i'll listen to it again before i even read sherlock holmes again i think because mm. Uh, mm. I, I prefer stephen fry's voice in my head than my own when it comes to sherlock have you read so what watch- sherlock yeah, I did read. Uh, I had a few um, different uh, uh, collections mm. uh, that I got from secondhand bookshops. Yep. I'm trying to remember the, the name of the, the, uh, the, the versions of the books. They have like a gold circle on the covers always, mm. in which, um, not Penguin, but one of the other big houses from way back in the 80s or whatever. Yep. And uh, yeah, so I read collections, you know. I think I came across Sherlock Holmes before I read him, obviously, just culturally I came across him. Yep. But then I must have started reading different stories. Um, yeah, late teens probably again. Yep. And uh, yeah, one of definitely one of the, the books that got me involved in, that, t- that turned me on to reading when I'd been definitely turned off it by my schooling. Uh, yeah, yeah. And... Also, just the story of Arthur Conan Doyle, I think what took me back to Sherlock Holmes, even though I knew of Sherlock Holmes as a concept, was um, a letter that uh, that Sherlock Holmes, that uh, Arthur Conan Doyle wrote after meeting Oscar Wilde. Mm. Uh, there was a famous meeting between Oscar Wilde, Kipling, and Arthur Conan Doyle in Langham's in London. And uh, after the meeting in which an American uh, businessman commissioned Oscar Wilde to write The Picture of Dorian Gray, and Arthur Conan Doyle to write uh, 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 um, what's the first one? Scarlet uh, Study in Scarlet Study in Scarlet Study in Scarlet yeah uh, and and I was like oh I've never actually read uh, the Sherlock Holmes stories I've obviously seen versions I've probably seen the Robert Downey Jr. versions the Guy, the Guy Ritchie films hmm. and I liked those I, I, you know, I, I think yeah, Robert Downey Jr. did a good job to do his kind of own version of Sherlock hmm. Um and yeah, and then, and then I read them and I was like, whoa, Conan Doyle, what a writer. I yeah. love the detail. Um, you know, not not a day goes by where, not an episode goes by where we don't mention Moby Dick, but definitely right. Melville's, Melville's uh, you know, detail and study in these kind of, um, in, in Moby Dick, you know, he, he goes on whole sections where he talks about whale Whales. or, or yeah. s- p- rigging or whatever it is. Yep. That you know, Arthur Conan Doyle was a, was a doctor, and the kind of tangents he takes and to explain things and talk about things, I just was there for all of it. it. I was entranced, loved every second of it, and there wasn't you know, I, there's no like, oh, I'm bored of this. Yeah. Always, yeah, I'm waiting to the end, and I'm upset even when the solution comes through. Mm. Yeah, great yeah. stuff. How, I mean, how did you um, how did you encounter Sherlock Holmes for the first time? I'm not sure on the first time. He's 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 my second favorite detective behind Mr. <laughs> Poirot. Um, but yeah, I think I think like you, I'd experienced him sort of culturally before. 
before I'd read any. I read I read my first ones at university when we were studying mystery mystery fiction, and so we had to read like the original Edgar Allan Poe sort of stories where that that whole detective narrative is is born. Um, but yeah, these these audio books. I mean, I th- I find them very easy to read, and they were always. I had the complete works and they'd be if I was ever bored of reading or I just needed like a refresher I'd dip into just a random Sherlock Holmes because there are some that are like four pages long but they still pack a punch and it was just like a nice palate cleanser you just refresh it but it's exactly the same with Stephen Fry I mean he he's he's brilliant he does it he does it so well um he does everything so well to be fair Mm -hmm. when you're listening to them which do you see a Sherlock Holmes? I think I see, and I think this is probably because Stephen Fry probably sees. I see, I see Jeremy Brett, mm. uh, or a version of Jeremy Brett. I, he's not as angular as Jeremy Brett. Sorry, I don't know if are you hearing my WhatsApp go buzz. I'm no. Just going to close that. Oh, okay, good. Um, I think I see a kind of I see an intensity of Jeremy Brett, but I think maybe I see a bit of a softer version. Jeremy Brett's got quite an angular face, mm. and I think mm. actually. Conan Doyle describes him as being quite angular mm. but uh, to me I don't know if that's something which Stephen Fry's narration gives it it's a bit plumper it's a bit more not cuddly but slightly more approachable yep uh, and that's the kind of the homes that forms in my mind with Stephen Fry uh, because it's Stephen Fry's voice and I, and I can't help but be comforted by it and to be attracted to it and, and engrossed by it so when Jeremy Brett you know if you watch those that great you know his great performances even especially the late ones which have really interesting nuances to them um much like you know conan doyle came back much later and did more stories mm. um which you know you know they're not bad either it's not like he was you know friends reunion style crap but, you know it was yeah stuff. yeah no um and so yeah i think it's, it's it was a bit of a, a nice mix of that and stephen fry just I don't know. I know. He, he reads them yeah. so wonderfully because obviously he's so intimate with them and has known them for so long. Mm. Mm. But yeah, I just love them. And yeah, how, how do you see Sherlock? Well, the first time I read Sherlock was was at uni and that was 2014 sort of peak Benedict Cumberbatch Sherlock BBC one. So I see Benedict Cumberbatch. I, I see the, the over-the-top dramatic sort of Sherlock that's there that's... <laughs> a bit more subtle at times but that's who I see when I'm when I'm reading them and and I'm happy with that yeah but I, I do like the Robert Downey Jr. ones I like the Jeremy Brett ones as well um, yeah if someone brings their own sort of nuance and attention to the character then I'm here for it I love Sherlock in all forms and I'm, I'm happy to embrace anyone that takes him on and how, and how I mean you like you said you came from a detective story uh, pedigree with mm-hmm. your love of Agatha Christie and your love mm-hmm. of Hercule Poirot I didn't have you know he was really the kind of first real detective story I came across mm-hmm. before I came, before I really ran into um, uh, reading Sherlock Holmes my favourite detective was Goran played by D'Onofrio on Criminal Intent Law and Order Criminal Intent nice. <laughs> he was my favourite <laughs> and he's a kind of he's a bit Sherlock Holmesy. he's kind of a mm. a modern a modern uh I mean, I guess Monk is the modern Columbo, but mm. uh, D'Onofrio was a bit of Columbo's version than Monk ever was. But um, yeah, but then when you, I don't know, I encountered Conan Doyle and just the world he creates, the tone that he carries, the authority that he carries, I was completely transformed into, I think that's the best bit as well, because, you know, all the recreations are great and, you know, the modern Sherlock with with, uh, with uh, Cumberbatch is good. Um, but just the Victorian era, that you mm. get in in Arthur Conan Doyle to me was just glorious, and uh, you reminded me before, and I just had to quickly look it up because I couldn't remember the name of it. But one of my favourite uh, things about Conan Doyle, apart from uh, the obviously the stories, is did you know about the cricket club that he was part of? No. So there is a wonderful, famous cricket club called the Alahakbaris. Which, in, which is an amateur cricket club f- founded by J.M. Barry, who wrote Peter Pan and, mm. and Courage and, and other the great other great stuff. 
Um, and this this is the people who were in this cricket team. As I said, J.M. Barry and Arthur Conan Doyle, Rudyard Kipling, H.G. Wells, P.G. Woodhouse, G.K. Chesterton, Jerome K. Jerome, A.A. Milne, uh, Walter Raleigh, uh, uh, Tennyson, um, who else? Like so many people. Yeah, what the fuck? And uh, Alla Huckbury's is a portmanteau of, uh, of kind of what came from uh, Allah Akbar, heaven help us, a kind mm. of version of that, because they were terrible. Yeah. And they purposefully, <laughs> they purposefully never warmed up before their games because they didn't want the other teams to see how terrible they are and then know <laughs> that there was, they were going to get dominated. So they wanted it to be a surprise. And there's great, uh, there's a, a whole great kind of uh, literary history around this amateur cricket team full of great writers who used to kind God. of meet up they all loved cricket and they would just sit there talking, but they were terrible. Yeah. Um, and yeah, I don't know. I've never seen it. I would love to see like a series about Allah or something. I would yeah. watch the shit out of that. That would be hilarious. God, it's just a different world. That, like, mm, that'd be funny. Just, I, I don't yeah. know. You just wouldn't see that these days, I don't feel. Yeah. God. But I love, I, love I, don't know, I love that kind of silliness and that Victorian stuff. And, you know, there's nothing, you know, like... Um, Lestrade and all these hapless Scotland Yard people and mm. you know, I don't know I just love that whole dynamic of you know I guess it's class and a bunch of other things but it's really this this character which can just kind of permeate everything because he's kind of mm. so exceptional yep um, oh god yeah but the modern retellings are also wonderful you know and I love how they change them slightly to adjust to have you know modern style characters mm. yeah I think they adjust them pretty good for how different the worlds are um mm. but yeah the victorian age uh, reading them yeah it's fantastic the richness of it I-, I love it yeah so i nicked your second so what yep. was your first my first was dracula oh yeah okay i couldn't i couldn't go past um I, I, I don't even know how this got on to my Audible account. It, it just sort of appeared there one day and I avoided it for months. I'd never read any horror literature. I wasn't really interested in horror literature. I'm not really interested in the horror genre. Um, I guess I, I, I don't see the value in sort of jump scare horror movies and stuff like that. And they scare me, but they also don't scare me. And so I guess I avoided a horror book because I never thought something like literature could be scary in the way that it needed to be to be classified horror. Fast forward a few months, I, I don't know why, but I tuned into it. And I mean, it's got a pretty, pretty slow opening two, three chapters when he's sort of fumbling around a bit but when he gets into it it's it's fantastic it's easily my favorite audio book it's a production there's a team of a team of people who we got alan coming tim curry so some big names and they just knock it for six i mean you've listened to it as well i loved it it's a fantastic story but yeah, the, I'd, I, up until this point, I'd never um, experienced an audio book with multiple voices, voice actors. And so to have different voice actors for different characters was just amazing. And it, it's changed my perception on audio books. I loved it. What, what did you think? Yeah, I loved it as well. I mean, I similar to you, I have a... I mean, I, I think I have an even sharper aversion to horror. I have zero mm. time for horror of any yep. stripe. Does not interest me and it annoys people. They're like, no, but just try it. I'm like, no, just flatly no. I'm sorry. I'm just going to, this is the mm. one place where I draw the line so sharply. <laughs> I have yeah. no interest. But to me, Dracula's not horror. It's very much late gothic. Mm. And Fair. one of my other kind of honorable mentions, like late choices, depending on how we go for time is kind of my favorite gothic uh and and another great retelling and i think the gothic genre really uh trans uh, is transposed into audio wonderfully mm. it is a mysterious genre by definition it, it requires the sublime which makes bellowing voices and good narration and uh the kind of 
you know, the great to be taken even away from the page and to just have the words can even emphasize large, large sections of these stories because you just get to see it in your mind without, without even having the feeling that you're reading. Yeah. Um, so that really it has a very nice evocative aspect to it. And yeah, I loved it. I thought uh, there were, you know, Bram Stoker could have uh, hurried it up in some of the later sections. <laughs> like the denouement yes. took a little while, but I think it's about, at, at one at one to one speed like 16 hours yeah i think it's about 16 not, hours yeah not not too bad it's kind of what i would call maybe medium length as far as audiobooks go mm. uh and it uh i loved it it was magical it, it definitely wasn't i didn't obviously like arthur uh conan doyle's sherlock holmes you know about dracula you know a lot of the myth about it you know about vampires. Mm. You know Transylvania. I've been to Transylvania, and Have you? Uh, yeah, I didn't actually go to the castle stuff, but you know everything's Dracula. Yeah, There's a yeah. Tourist trade about Dracula. So, uh, and I think I've seen one of the um, one one or not the uh, not the great. Uh, um, who's the film with? Uh, oh, Christopher Lee. With Christopher Lee, I, I haven't seen that. When I'm told it's a, a, it's very good, but I've seen mm. you know some other stuff of Dracula. Mm. Um, but yeah, I mean, if, if if anyone else has got an aversion to horror, don't worry because it's not scary. It's gothic, wonderfully written. Oh, it's beautifully uh, the, written. The, the the characters, like you said, Alan Cummings and Tim Curry and and anyone else in the cast, you know, you have very great. Um, character studies in Van Helsing and in mm. uh, the other characters you also you know it's, it's 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 also which I didn't realize epistolary it's it's told through letters mm. Um, mm. and you get nice transitions in time uh, and because they're letters it does again uh, appeal to audible readings um, so I thought it was just magical and like you said it, ha- it has a lot of great uh, performative aspects around it. it has good production around it you do get a lot of atmospheric um you know vibes from coastlines and dark seas and yeah um, big dark know, and forests and amsterdam to london to transylvanian castles and stuff and yeah yeah absolute loved it definitely uh was was up i knew you were going to pick it because you yeah. <laughs> so, so i didn't go for it but uh you you kept on jabbering on about it and i was like all right all right i'm gonna do it and very happy because it was a great great book and um and uh yeah i don't know i i didn't think i'd be that much i think i saw that hugh jackman van helsing film with kate beckinsale i don't know if you've seen oh, that God, it, was no, pretty ter- it was pretty terrible no. there's uh, actually um the the writers who did the bbc sherlock with benedict cumberbatch did a three-part series of dracula called dracula on netflix um and it's 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 good. It's very, it's very, very good actually. But um, it's fun to watch after reading the book. There's only three of them. They're an hour and a half long. Very similar to Sherlock. Um, but yeah, they're they're a good amount of fun as well. So, I mean, you're not a fan of horror, but since you know the story, it might might mm-hmm. not be too bad for you. But yeah, they're good yeah. fun. Check them out as well. Maybe I'll look into that one. Do need yeah. always a show to watch. Mm. Uh, but yeah, great audiobook. Good mm. selection for Charles. On to your second. My second is the collected radio dramas of Jeeves and Worcester by P.G. Woodhouse. Mm. I am a Woodhouseian obsessive, uh, and this this has got a, you know there's one of these dramatizations. It's got a full cast: uh, Michael Hordern, Richard Briers, other people. Um, I can't remember. I think it tells most of the Jeeves and Worcester books are included. Uh, you know, the omnibus and, and it was just, uh, for me, it was one of those experiences where the transition from the voices in my head to the, to the audio book was mm-hmm. seamless. It yep. was just good. It was just like, yep, that's how I heard the voices. That's what I, that's exactly and that's partly because P.G. Woodhouse's voice is so distinctive, mm. um, and his so comedy you, is so distinctive. 
you'd read this first or some of his works yeah, first? Yeah, I definitely read uh, a few of them, maybe not all of them. Uh, and I've read other P.G. Woodhouse, uh, the P. Smith books, the Molyneux books. I read a few and now I've been going back last two years, three years because there's so many great Audible versions because P.G. Woodhouse mm. is so funny and so adaptable to, to Audible. Far more adaptable to Audible than to uh, Screen. Stephen Fry and Hugh Laurie did a famous uh, series of Jeeves in Worcester in which Stephen Fry played uh, Jeeves and obviously Hugh Laurie played uh, Bertie Worcester. Um, which is also good, but it's very hard to capture on screen when you don't have P.G. Woodhouse's voice and his tone and his comedy because it's all in the writing, which of course you don't lose in the audio version. And But you just get all the additions of silliness and uh, uh, absurdity and ridiculousness of this high... And if anyone doesn't know, P.G. Woodhouse uh, was a kind of... Um, Turn of the century, maybe started writing books earliest 20th century, died in the 70s at, a, at the age of like 96, wrote a lot, wrote a lot of books, mm. was a very, very productive man, um, lived in New York. He also wrote, uh, you know, uh, for Hollywood and musicals and, uh, but he was just, he's, Jeeves and Worcester is his most famous, obviously Ask Jeeves, the website sprung out of <laughs> Jeeves, which is this, he's this uh, omnipotent butler um omniscient as well you know just knows everything uh mm. can do anything and then you have bertie worcester who's just this flagrant uh hapless privileged uh you know georgian man living mm. in london you know going about town getting into all sorts of mischief and jeeves is helping him out of it yep. um and you know always at beautiful mansions and in the riviera and all, all these places and and they're just you know short stories or or uh, sometimes larger but short novels um very very adaptable always you know open and shut cases where jeeves saves the day in the end yeah. but it's just the richness of uh pg woodhouse's hilarious uh prose um that could go i mean maybe i could find a little uh quote to give you a bit of a taste if no one's read um no one's encountered Woodhouse before. This is the beginning to the book. Right ho, Jeeves. Jeeves, I said, may I speak frankly? Certainly, sir. What I may have to say may wound you. Not at all, sir. Well, then. Uh, actually, no, wait. Hold on a minute. I've gone off the rails. I don't know if you have had the same experience, but the snag I always come up against when, and when I'm telling a story is the dash difficult problem of where to begin it. It's a thing you don't want to go wrong over, because one false step and you're sunk. I mean, if you fool about too long at the start, trying to establish atmosphere, as they call it, and all that sort of rot, you fail to grip and the customers walk out on you. Get off the mark, on the other hand, like a scalded cat, and your public is at a loss. It simply raises its eyebrows and can't make out what you're talking about. And in, my, and in opening my report of the complex case of Gussie Finknottle, Madeline Bassett, my cousin Angela, my aunt Delia, my uncle Thomas, young Tuppy Gossip, and the cook Anatole, with this above spot of dialogue, I see that I may have made the second of these two floaters. Uh, it's just, I mean, it's that that's, kind of So that's how he opens. That's the opening to a story. It's, gone, it's basically yeah. like that. Most of the stories open with a hungover Bertie Worcester being awoken to Jeeves coming in with his famous hangover cure. Ah, uh, yes. And uh, and then stuff happens all the time. Uh, but it's just, I don't know, you know, the amount of Woodhouse, W.H. Auden called Woodhouse England's Eden. Mm. And that he, Woodhouse is it's just permanent childhood. It's permanent playfulness. It's schoolyard fun, even the even when it's at the height of you know prime ministers and all these kind of things. It's always like everyone's just a kid, and it's always innocent and fun and pranking and silliness and uh, and you know it's just completely engrossing. And you can melt into this little Eden of Woodhouse and just have the most spoilt rotten time. Mm, um, yeah. And he's just so, and, and he's also, I think, one of the greatest writers of English since Shakespeare. He's 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 a, he's pure ability with the language was mm. unmatched. Just descriptions of people. I remember just coming off the top of my head a description of one of his aunts or something like that. Some old lady 
uh, and he said she looked as if she had been poured into her clothes and forgotten to say mm-hmm. when <laughs> yeah wow yeah <laughs> things like that i mean he's just brilliant and um you know sometimes you think you're on top of the world and then fate comes up behind you with a piece of lead piping uh, it's all <laughs> always beautifully imagined wonderful and, and it's just never stops it you know yeah. it's one of those things where it just never runs out of amazing um amazing good content mm. and yeah so he is perfectly adaptable for audible i've listened to those collected dramas the mr mulliner stories are on there which is kind of told stories about this family or this guy's relations but they're all it's all centered around a pub um and then there's the p smith the guy's called smith but there's a silent p in front of it and, <laughs> <laughs> and so is, is that smith and he goes smith actually the p is silent and everyone's like, what? <laughs> <laughs> and he's this kind of like very you know genteel uh you know gentleman but he just gets in you know sometimes he's like i think i'm going to be a journalist in new york now and he goes mm. and does that or he becomes a cricketer or does all sorts of things and he just kind of manages to i don't know it's He's a perfectly great for all Audible versions, and anyone who hasn't listened to Woodhouse, audi- like audiobooks, is a great place to start. Loved it. So how how long are the stories? Oh, I mean, I think probably each story, uh, or it, actually, Stephen Fry does readings as well. Mm-hmm. Um, I listen to Stephen Fry do some readings of the Blandings novels, which they're all kind of book length, and the Jeeves and Worcester stories are quite short, maybe you know the same length as like a Sherlock story. Yep. Uh, you know probably in audible about an hour, in, in audio about an hour and mm-hmm. two hours and um and uh, the blandings ones are a bit longer and stephen fry is also a great lover of woodhouse i didn't much like his i think just because i didn't i'd never heard woodhouse in his voice mm. so i didn't really grab it too much i think i prefer it in my own either reading it or in the when you got a full cast but yep uh, but that's also because the Blandy novels, in my opinion, aren't the best. But they're still funny. Um, but yeah, I don't know. Accessible to everyone. You can just dip into them. But start with Jeeves and Worcester because Jeeves and Worcester is is right. You know, he's always on top form. Always on par. Yeah. Mm-mm-mm. Nice. And right, yeah, well, literally, like, I, I go, I can listen to it all the time. I listen to it to relax. I listen to it when I'm stressed. I laugh everywhere. Oh, on, the, on the trains in the streets i'm just giggling chuckling away sometimes like cough laughing it's true. like it's true yeah he gets me all the time <laughs> <laughs> it's very true nice all right well my next pick is a book i know you have also listened to on audi on audible um john banville the sea oh yeah mm-hmm. was this one I of your ju- picks i no it wasn't but i just all right good to this. Yeah. I didn't know you were listening to this. No, I was keeping it secret. Little, oh, <laughs> shit. You little sneaky bugger. Good stuff. Yeah. Had to keep yeah. it secret. Okay, tell um, me about it. You liked it? Yeah, I, I absolutely loved it. Um, the thing I love about it is it is a very short story. Well, not very short, but I think I looked it up going at your 300 words a minute of reading. You can have this story done in about three hours but the audible version is five to six hours so it's nearly double the length if you took if you just read it yourself and i think that's the reason i love it is because it's performed by jim norton i don't know anything else he's done but he just takes his time with it he 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 reads it so slowly it's it's poetic it's melodic i love it it's i don't know it's one of those it's it's sort of what got me thinking about whether if i read the book would i have the same experience with it compared to his reading Mm -hmm. but i think his performance just takes me to a different realm of the story i mean it is a fantastic story what did you think of the actual story yeah i mean i think it's a brilliant story you know it has these two distinct um timelines uh, you know, mm. he, he, uh, to those who don't know, uh, John Banville, a uh, great Irish writer, at the Sea won the Booker Prize in early maybe 2005. 2005, I think. 2005. It is, yeah. um, and it's a story about a guy who uh, his wife has died. He's an elderly man. 
you don't I don't believe you get exactly um know what he did as a career but I think he's an art historian vaguely yeah or has in some in, yeah. in that line of work a not so and, successful art historian yeah now and he talking kind of through a reflective journal on his life right and yeah he doesn't really know what to do he kind of is uh, a bit troubled by how his wife's death is affecting him and how he uh, certainly her last days and how that went Mm. Uh, and he goes back to a kind of beach house or a beach area in um, I can't remember what part of Ireland um, where he had stayed as a kid and so he's simultaneously I don't think his daughter uh, Claire is, is is you know trying to push him in certain directions you know as yep. an old man who is a bit lost she's trying to help him but he's a bit resistant and he doesn't like her Beyonce, her, her Beyonce, her fiance, <laughs> uh, and uh, and a few other things, and he kind of goes back and starts reliving these very nostalgic and very vivid uh, memories from his childhood, where he had a crush on the mother of another family staying at the beach, and and then he yep. kind of befriends these twins, who to him kind of come to rep- come to more or less in his memory be gods in a way they kind of got mm. these twin mythological god vibes um and so he's kind of switching between these two and yeah i mean i really liked it it's interesting i was just trying to look up on my phone uh on my audible account if i listen to the same version as you oh true so, i didn't um, consider that let's let's quickly let me see um bum, 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 that would bum. change that would change everything if you'd had a different experience Mm-hmm. Well, that'd be interesting then. To... Be... Yeah, no, I had the Jim Norton version as well. Oh, good. And uh, yeah, I mean, I definitely completely agree with the your opinion of the narration. I had a little moment at the beginning where I thought, mm, I don't know if I want to listen to this book. I think I want to read it. The he mm. Banville's uh, Banville's prose is very poetic, uh, oh, and it's something it's almost I would mythic. Rather very mythic and and you know, that's l- exactly the prose i enjoy yeah and but i felt like oh maybe this is something i want to sit with maybe this is something i want to be able to kind of like you know have on the page and and read the same line a few times and yep. um and and feel a bit of a physical connection with it rather than just it passing through my ears but yeah jim norton the the pace at which he did it, the different voices um and the the kind of I don't know. He, he's, his voice has a kind of sea breeze in it. It feels it's, mm. it's kind of aerated, lofty but deep, uh, yeah. and uh, like you said, he 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 brings a patience to the prose, which yeah. al- still allow you to kind of to feel the weight of that of the poetry inside it, because um, there's and there's so much brilliant uh, sea imagery and poetry and you know ecstatic talk about paintings and uh, mm. um, there's a lot of mytho- mythological yeah. references. He has a, who he has like an obsession with Baudrillard, the French painter Baudrillard. I think he talks mm. about for a long time. And anyway, yeah, it was a great, it was a great book. Uh, I it was the first Banville I'd ever read or listened it's my to. First Banville, yeah, yeah, and uh, yeah. I mean, it's a, it's a, it's a good book, and I think, yeah. The what did you think of the plot? What did you think of the how it ended? I like I think I was so swept along by how beautifully it was written that I wasn't too fussed about the actual story going on. Yeah. So yeah. Um so yeah, I like I was fine with everything mm-hmm. basically. Um but it was it was just so dreamlike that I was just happy to be there for the journey. Yeah. No dreamlike is such a, yeah, dreamlike is such a good description. There is a very dreamlike quality of the whole thing, especially because, you know, mm. he's looking back uh, at this time, which in his life he sees as very uh, vivid and formative and nostalgic. And I also like the fact that, you know, there's aspects of that dream because he's gone back to the place where he was and there's actually still a, a particular person there who was there when he was a child. And he's kind of able to tell him that one thing which he held 
no, I won't, I won't spoil it, but there's, there's a moment where as a young kid, he climbs up a tree and he overhears a conversation between the mum, the other family's mum, who he's, he's got a childhood crush on and, uh, and someone else. And he misinterprets this overheard conversation and kind of mm. carries that misinterpretation through him for the rest of his life, basically. And then he comes back and, and then he eventually sums up the courage to kind of bring it up to her. And she's like, no, it was literally completely different. It was a whole yeah. other thing. You, yeah. you saw that wrong. Mm. Um, and it was much more interesting than what he thought it was. Yeah. And so I love that, that, you know, he is living in this dream. He'd carried this stuff with him, this nostalgia and these emotions which he'd carried with him had been uh, misinterpreted, deformed, weren't the way he, um, weren't the way he, imagined them or had taken them with him and how these dreams had kind of affected the course of his life even when he was under misapprehensions which i think is you know really true to life um, oh yeah absolutely yeah yeah and then it's, you know it's got it's mythical and it's got quite a, a mythical ending or a dramatic tragic ending perhaps mm, don't yeah. want to wreck it too much but all that inside quite a short book and a, and a good narration um yeah loved it all right for my number three Mm-hmm. And uh, this is Half of a Yellow Sun by Chimamanda Ngozi Adichie, read by Zainab Ja. Don't know if I'm pronouncing that right. Um, brilliant book, 2006 mm-hmm. published, uh, and ah, oh, brilliant novel, brilliantly narrated, and uh, I mean, amongst other things, if for those who haven't read it or don't know about, uh, I mean, Adichie I think is very famous, but in my opinion, you know, one of the best writers working today. Hmm. And uh, so about other things, it, it kind of tells the story of the Biafran war in the late sixties, the Nigerian civil war, when um, Biafra tried to separate, Igbo territory tried to separate, mm-hmm. uh, did not go well. Uh, but um, yeah. And obviously there's a lot of colonialism, a lot of colonial hands in the, in the pot, in the pot. Uh, and a lot of history uh, leading up to this point. Uh, it, 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 but it's, it, and it is, it's, uh, when work costs, it's a, it's, a, it's a war novel, but it's a beautiful story about, um, mm. about families, uh, about uh, flawed, complex characters, the bright, smart characters, um, and stories entwine. Uh, there's kind of an, an, an aging uh, academic slash, you know, revolutionary. He has a young uh, servant from a village uh, who's probably, in the end, the kind of um, the main harbour of emotion in the novel kind of spurs out of this of this young um, kind of kid who's, who's there just earning a few, whatever, helping this, um, helping this academic. Uh, and then there's, uh, you know, a kind of wealthy family in Lagos and two daughters who, uh, you know, are now, you know, age one is also an academic and the other one um gets into a love triangle with a young british journalist uh, mm. it, there's lots of things going on and yeah. it's uh, absolutely brilliant it um the concentration of character the uh the ability f- to be brought up to speed on the very complex history of nigeria uh, and mm. all the kind of hands and and um tides of time that led to the war the violence yep. and the capriciousness of war is very incredibly shown as well. Um, but, you know, it's just, I don't know. To me, it was an amazing book, really well narrated. Um, yep. Long I listen? I think, oh, how long was it? I mean, no, not, not massively, maybe 20 hours or something. I can't remember. Yep. I listened to it a, to a, a, quite a while ago. Um, it might have been one of the books one of the first books i got on my audible account maybe um but because it, it it was like oh wow this is how good audible and audiobooks can be yeah um i've been trying to cut a couple of other books by adichie and and she's an absolute um fucking genius and you know this is the plotting is amazing the absolute uh her her pace is incredible mm. Mm. But there's also very beauty, uh, very much um, beautiful tone to everything, even at its darkest moments. Um, and I don't think uh, the the Zainab Jar 
uh, or however you pronounce her name is is British. I don't even think she's of Nigerian descent, but she manages to get a wonderful uh, accent and you know not not just um, different Nigerian accents, but there's a, there's mm. Southern American characters and she gets like a Southern accent. There's a Br- British accent. There's lots of different accents and I don't know, amazing. Love this yeah. book and loved the audio version. Yeah, great. Yeah, well, I think it's just a testament to how talented some of these voice actors are. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think she's a theatre actor. I looked her up on mm. Wiki for this thing. Um, I've never seen her in anything, but uh, yeah, very talented retelling. And now that I uh, remember how good it was, I'm going to try and see if she's if she's read anything else um, mm. for Audible because... Half of Yellow Sun was great, and I know a lot of people have read it. it it's a, it's a book I see on on people's bookshelves. Um, yeah. Although that doesn't mean people have read the book just because it's on their yes, bookshelf. That's... But if you haven't, the audible version is great and worth a shot. For sure. Nice, good stuff. So, what is your next pick, sir? My next pick is this was the very first book I ever got on Audible, Mrs. Dalloway. Oh, yeah. Nice. Um, it's performed, uh, written by Virginia Woolf and then performed by Annette Benning. Mm. And I remember I downloaded it because I had to read it for uni and just didn't have the time to read, basically. Like you were saying, it's uh, audible audiobooks are very accessible for that reason. And so I downloaded it and started listening to it and and, and straight away... It was just simply stunning. Her voice was just like a breeze on a summer day. She was beautiful. And I remember talking to my uni professor about it and she's like, oh, what do you think? Because of this, of course, the story you... Sorry, I should explain. The story follows uh, Mrs. Dalloway. It's, It's told in one day. And it follows her and her train of thoughts. It's very modernistic. H- have you read the book? No, like, I, I when I think I was living in Melbourne at some point, mm-hmm. I downloaded a ver- I think it was the Annette Benning version, and then it yep. didn't uh, vibe with me. I don't know why. Maybe it just uh, wasn't the right time to come across Virginia Woolf because I've since mm-hmm. come. A- I've since had a Virginia Woolf phase. Mm-hmm. Listeners, this podcast will know that I recently read Orlando. Um, yep. And I've been dipping into uh, some uh, other essays, Virginia Woolf, in the last few weeks. So I think I'm ready mm-hmm. to give it another year. I'm ready to give it yeah. another year. But I've also, I was thinking about To the Lighthouse, Ms. Dalloway. So I think maybe you're uh, tipping my tipping my balance now. Towards <laughs> Hopefully I don't ruin her this though. Um, so because it follows a stream of consciousness in, in her own mind, listening to to Annette Benning perform that in such a she, she's just so like I said a breeze on a summer's day very relaxing that I'd just be driving along and I'd just get lost in her words and wouldn't follow any of the storyline yeah but I was just I was with her wherever she was but I was not in the story I was just looking out the window I was just lulled into submission by her voice it was like it was it was beautiful. She's very melodic. She, yeah. And this is actually a question that I really wanted to talk about um, coming away from our list at the moment is that the medium of audio is obviously so different from reading, which is silent, quiet place, quiet generally. Um, mm. And you're absorbed into a small frame of your view. Um, where audio, your eyes are free. And do you, I think I definitely have, I can generally especially if i enjoyed an audiobook recall where i was recall if that mm. changed my interaction with the place i was in i can certainly remember occasions when i was like down not feeling it and uh you know feeling in in but then simultaneously being a little social butterfly and so going out for the night and oh, i don't want to be a dour person and so you know yep. on the way there I'm, i'll be like oh, i'm just going to put on some pg woodhouse walk along and then by the time i get there i'm chipper and i'm life of the party um and then you know other times you know train journeys bus journeys planes uh particular places where i've lived and would go on walks around there i can vividly remember through an author's voice through a book uh and so it really is a completely different way that it, it 
interlaces with your life than standard reading which is one of the reasons i fell in love with it so much is that you Mm. can not just read a lot more but you get a whole different experience i mean it's it's like going from i mean it's not that it's better i I still you know reading has its own uh in my opinion is still the top you know it's still test it's still it's still test cricket but you know there is great other versions of cricket and great other versions of things which uh, just provide a different vibe for different experience lens. yeah so how do yeah. you do do you does it strongly inter- interact with yeah the place well that now listening? that you've said it i distinctly remember listening to dracula it was the middle of winter and i was doing a lot of walking at night time so i can distinctively remember that um what else i said john banville just walking around tanya park i can distinctly remember doing that um for one of my picks for my next pick which i will save it but it was when i was traveling through europe so i can remember all the long bus rides listening to that and then mrs dalloway yep driving to uni and um along the parkway Mm. i can distinctively remember just forgetting this story because i'm following her train of thought and that's getting caught up in my train of thought and i'm just her voice is just lulling me into this dreamlike state and i'm just looking at the trees and the world going by as i was driving so yeah that's good you brought that up because yep i can remember it all yeah because i think i remember miss delaway miss delaway i just had this flash of um i think i was living in uh north fitzroy in melbourne and getting mm-hmm. on the tram to go to across the yarra to go to this internship at this shitty magazine like online like a media site listicle place i was mm. working for and uh you know just being on this packed train at rush hour in the mornings and there's like i don't know everyone's getting on and it was cold and i was like what is this fucking city <laughs> yeah <laughs> and yeah. and then just dalloway and i was just like uh this is just not fitting right and you know maybe i was yep. 10 minutes in like i did not even give mm. it a big chance but i still remember that that 10 minutes and being like this is not the right time i will come back yep. to this um and that happens a lot sometimes I'm like no mm. this is not the right time this is not the right place and it's interesting that you have these relationships with a with a book that you wouldn't normally have um or just to just get, get out extra, extra layers it's great yeah and yeah and some i mean that's it, the escapism too i mean you can it can transform what was hours of tedium and wasted hours into some of the most mm. enjoyable parts of your life that you can remember yeah. vividly and you can remember as a relationship you had with a plot with a story with a with an author um i don't know i'm just so uh like thankful that it's kind of oh, an yeah. affordable Thank thing God. yeah yeah <laughs> and also i don't know if you fucking realize but audible just released this plus category where there's basically no. now just thousands of books that you can just listen to and they don't they don't they're not credited. Oh, they're the ones that are part of your subscription. Yeah. Yeah. They're like heaps I just of saw the that. books that and I've, I've paid heaps. for with credits before. And I'm what the <laughs> fuck, Audible? <laughs> I used credits on this shit last time. And now, yeah. now it's free. But yeah. I don't care. I, I like, who cares? It's more, I mean, I don't mind. Mm. I listen to enough of them that, I, you know, I'll pay Audible, whatever. But um, yeah, no. But what, what did you like most about Miss Dalloway? What, what, was it just that, the, the beauty of voice, the way it transported you? Yeah, I think I think it was the beauty of her voice. Like I remember saying to my professor, it was great, but I can't remember it because I just couldn't pay attention. And she thought that was funny, and she didn't fail me, which was which was nice of her. Mm. Um, yeah, it was also my f- it was one of my first experiences with like a modernistic text and following a train of thought. So I think that was quite quite nice. But yeah, I think it was just right place, right time those long drives to uni down the parkway through all the trees and everything like that definitely would have, would have helped. Um, yeah. Yeah. Because I mean, it, like, it's, it's kind of a meta thing that stream of consciousness writing, and then it does become, that is how you go about your life. And all of a sudden mm. you've got someone else's stream of consciousness in your stream of life. Yeah. And it's, it, it sometimes it, fits really nicely and sometimes it's like whoa i wasn't in a crazy neurotic mood so <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> now so there's th- a crazy think... neurotic person in my head <laughs> 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 yeah 
Yeah, I think it fitted really nicely just because because Annette was just so calm in her in her portrayal of it that it was just it was just relaxing, mm. and that was really nice. Yeah. Oh my god! Good stuff. Mm. So on to my fourth pick, which is Wolf Hall by Hilary Mantel, read by Simon Slater. Nice. Now. Uh, have you read any of the Wolf Hall series of Hilary Mantel? No. So very, I think it won the Booker as well. And, mm-hmm. you know, you've since had come up the bodies, you know, bring up the bodies. And oh, the most recent one last year, the third was something in the mirror. I can't remember. I haven't read the last one. But uh, you have, you know, really amazing historical fiction. Mm. Uh, I met a Belgian guy here in Berlin uh, who was uh, went to my university who was writing a PhD thesis on Wolf Hall. So it gets um, it's getting academic attention, but mm-hmm. uh, it's a brilliant historical novel, uh, mainly focusing on uh, you know one of the most written about periods in British history, which is the court of Henry VIII. Um, and unlike most tellings of this period where, you know, Henry VIII is depicted usually as in, in, in pretty uh, standard way, but usually Sir Thomas More is depicted as this great martyr and Cromwell, uh, Thomas Cromwell, not Oliver Cromwell, Thomas Cromwell is displayed as this kind of scheming, uh, you know, uh, Catholic dog Um who's you know trying to do uh, cardinal Wolsey's dirty work and all this kind of stuff where in mm-hmm. um mm-hmm. hillary mantel kind of does a does a lin Manuel miranda hamilton twist where she kind of turns show, puts oliver Cromwell as this you know guy who came from nothing not noble no bloodline no lands just incredibly clever and managed to claw his way up the social ladder and become mm-hmm. a real political mover and shaker inside Henry VIII's court. Um, and so it follows Thomas Cromwell's rise to power, follows the fall of Sir Thomas More. Um, I don't know if you've uh, seen the play or there's a film, uh, A Man for All Seasons. No. It's a great, that's about, more about Sir Thomas More and you know, yeah. Cromwell is depicted very poorly in it. Uh, so oh. it's kind of the reverse of A Man for All Seasons where, um, you know, instead of you... Thomas More is more sanctimonious than saint and mm-hmm. Cromwell is more, um, I don't know, evocative and, 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 and has, he's the, he's the main protagonist. He's kind of the hero, this guy who's usually the villain. Um, yeah. Yep. And so you get a lot of these great perspectives and I, you know, obviously it's one of the most written about and serialized and there's like seven series about the Tudors and everyone knows about his wives and, you know, probably yep. one of the most famous kings in, in European history. Um, mm-hmm. But yeah, you get a bit of a different viewpoint and all that. You get a different viewpoint about, you know, for me, what is really interesting, um, and, you know, that's what The Man for All Seasons and Thomas More's Utopia and, and all this uh, political theory around the split from Rome. You know, obviously, ostensibly, it's just Henry wanting to secure his line with a male heir and mm-hmm. wanting to fuck the shit of Anne Boleyn. Um, uh, but you know, in terms of the whole scheme of things, it's it's Britain being Britain, which is doing things differently, is being Brexit and doing dumb shit. Um, yep. But uh, in this case, it's splitting from Rome, which is not so dumb, uh, or at least depending <laughs> on how you look at it. But, <laughs> but uh, yeah, it's yeah, great book. It's Mantel is an absolute marvel of a writer. Um, mm-hmm. It's done so well, and you know, just the cast of characters. Obviously, you, you know, you have characters which you know very well: Anne Boleyn, Wolseley, Cromwell, Moore, all these kind of people. And yet, you have entirely new, flawed, uh, you know, cracked characters with you know beautiful um, capabilities and wonderful cleverness and 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 emotions and and nuance and family lives and things like that. And then you also have the conniving, conniving political level where, you know, people are taking risks, where people are, you know, obviously this is Henry VIII. If you don't do what he likes, eventually you'll lose your head. Yep. That's kind of a spoiler, but, you know, 
it's been like five hundred years. That's history. Years. <laughs> 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 if you don't know what happened, then like catch up. Um, but yeah, and so it's uh, you know Cromwell, this man from nothing, armed with only his wit, um, and he's a kind of mastermind caught in a battle he can't win, but yep. he does very well for himself. Um, he, d- he gives himself a good account, and yeah, brilliant, uh, brilliant mm-hmm. book, and. Um, yeah, I haven't read the last one, which I think got released, so I might try and audiobook that because I read Bring Up the Bodies. Um, I wanted to see, which is the second one, because I wanted to see what the difference was between audio and and, um, and physically reading it. Um, and again, uh, you know, I couldn't tell much of a difference. It kind of seeped, you know, you don't know because I listened first and read second whether yeah. I just carried the voices with mm. me. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but... Uh, I mean, I, I loved it. So who cares? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Who cares? <laughs> yeah, it's good. And did you say you have one last one? I do. I don't really need to talk about it that much because it's going to come up a lot. But oh, it's yeah. Lord of the Rings. Lord of the Rings. Of course yeah. it is. I can't believe it's yeah. taken this long for you to bring I up know. Lord of the Rings. I know. It's been a while. Well, I haven't mentioned it at all, actually. This is the first time. If people don't know Seamus, which hopefully most of you don't, because that means that you're listeners, <laughs> not members of family <laughs> or what not. <laughs> Seamus is a ring. He loves the ring. Loves the rings. Yep. He's all about them rings. All He's... about the rings, baby. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I love Lord of the Rings. Um, it's performed by Rob Inglis. And I haven't looked in to see if there's other sort of uh, tellings by other voice actors so I'm not sure but I, I love him and it was, I was always going to love him because I love Lord of the Rings and it, it, yeah I was always going to love it He, I mean it's a very big story we all know it of course I think it's 55 hours all up there is a wealth of characters and he does voices for all of them some of them overlap a bit of course because you just can't have that many voices up your up your sleeve but he does it justice i love it and don't worry this will not be the last time lord of the rings is mentioned on this podcast well you know i don't think i'm gonna find the time to read lord of the rings so i might but the, if, if you get if you give the audible version a tick of approval then i know it's, it's got some serious it's got some serious chutzpah yeah well i like i've seen the movies enough times i've read the books twice and i think i've listened to them twice now as well so (laughs) yeah big lord of the rings fan (laughs) hey yeah i have not read any of them i've only seen the films like the films Mm. they're they're good so uh you know that's good enough again maybe like the harry potter things I think it's going to be something which I'm going to really enjoy sharing with someone. Yeah, listening to, that's very true. to a big world like that. Mm. With 55 hours, you know, there's some, there's some big, there's some big books you can knock over in 55 hours, which you know I've been meaning to <laughs> read for a long time. When it comes to you know, I've been, I've tried to listen to Middlemarch about seven mm. times, and I just can't swallow the audio version. I don't know why. But yep. if, um, you know, and there's a few other examples. I mean, we have talked about our friend Tolstoy and, yes, you know, War and Peace. You know, there's, there's lots, but I don't know. We'll see. Maybe Lord of the Rings would be a great thing to share with someone on a journey, mm. on a car ride, on, you know, a child, something like that. So it's definitely one of the things I might say. Yeah. But, yeah, I don't know. It also just sounds good. And I I, I sometimes feel that, you know, when you are in certain phases of life, the escapism of a proper world is, Mm. it seems daunting. It is a very rich world. It seems daunting because it means it's, it's it's a real thing. You go, it's, it's it's called, it's called change. (laughs) You've got to immerse yourself (laughs) in something new and it's completely immersive. Uh, So it seems daunting, but sometimes it's like, you're like, oh, once you do it. It's uh, it's so rewarding, and then you kind of find any excuse to listen to more, and that's you know that's when you're in peak listening mode. I love when I'm like, 
I'm just going to go for another walk. It's negative five, yeah. but fuck you. I'm just going <laughs> to... Yeah. yeah, absolutely. It's negative five and it's dark as shit and it's windy, but I feel like going for another walk so I can listen to more of this book. <laughs> yep. That's the best. Yeah. It was like 2 a.m. and I'm just walking around the streets listening to Dracula. Mm. Mm-mm-mm. Good times. Oh, God. Good times. It's good stuff. It's good to get out and socialize with no one. <laughs> so that you can listen to books. My with out, the shadows. My outside time. Yeah. Especially in lockdown. Yeah. I mean, yeah. Going yeah. for those, you know, trying to have your one daily excursion or whatever. Um, yep. Yep. Yeah. It's good stuff. Lord of the Rings. Damn. That's a good one. Mm. Well, is that, a, I don't know. I, I kind of had two I was throwing up between as my last one. I might just cover them quickly as kind of like honorable mentions. The first yep. one I, I kind of alluded to when we're talking about Dracula, which is the other great Gothic novel, which I thought was amazing and audible version. And that is Frankenstein by Mary Shelley, mm-hmm. read by Dan Stevens. An incredible reading. I love Frankenstein. Um, you know, you may think, oh, Black, like if you hate horror so much, why did you read Frankenstein? Uh mm-hmm. We're talking about Mary Shelley here. This is, you know, not horror. And uh, Frankenstein is one of the major texts. Frankenstein is philosophical. It's uh, an incredible, um, uh, a necessary book, more or less, for everyone to read. Uh, and and the Dan Stevens retelling is, is wonderful. Again, like Dracula, great productive value. And it really, uh, Jack, uh, Frankenstein goes really well with that. Uh, but the other one, uh, which I listened to recently, and I know you've read perhaps rather than listened to, which is Ooh. Love in a Time of Cholera by Gabriel ah, Garcia yes, Marquez, read by yep. Armando Duran. Uh, I listened to this recently and loved it. Uh, Duran was able to capture, you know, to service the enormity of emotional scale in Love mm. in a Time of Cholera, which, you know, people don't know. It's about a unrequited love which lasts 50 years or more and uh so that scale of novel which you know could be quite um tedious when you don't have uh you know gabriel garcia marquez in book form to kind of keep you going um Mm, very good then you really need a, a very good narration and i thought it was wonderful i thought he really managed to capture the high and the low um, he really managed to translate the city itself, which is such a big mm. character in Love in a Time of Cholera. Um, it's incredibly magical. Incredibly magical. For those who don't know, Love in a Time of Cholera is set in, you don't actually know the city, but basically it's Cartagena in northern mm. Colombia, some Colombian city on the Caribbean coast. So probably Cartagena. Um, and, you know, it's, uh, when's it set? Maybe turn of the century, late 19th century the age yeah. of, age of river boats and that kind of thing mm, yeah um and yeah it kind of takes place over 50 years or so and of this uh this guy's unrequited love for um this Femina married Daza. woman Femina Daza. and uh it is an amazing retelling i have listened to um I've heard people say that they've attempted to listen to Marquez in audible form and not liked it, found that, you know, Marquez Mm. has too many characters, has, that you know, it's too big uh, and you get lost. Um, I have never never found that in Love in a Time of Cholera. You know, that might be a problem I can imagine in 100 Years of Solitude, which has probably got a lot more characters, but... Yeah, yeah, um, a lot more expansive. Yeah, but in Love in a Time of Cholera, wonderful, great telling... And definitely, you know, it, it was a story which I um, was finding any excuse to, to tune into again and again. Mm. Superb. Yep. yep, I agree. No, it's a fantastic story. It's 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 some of the best prose I've ever I've ever read. Um. Yeah, I it, it was it was it was mind blowing. Some of the prose actually. Mm. I'm I'm excited to get into. A hundred years of solitude. Mm-hmm. At some point, I don't know. I never sort of jump straight back into writers straight away. Mm-hmm. If I know they're going to be good, I save them for the for the right moment. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. I think Marquez is someone I want to um, dip into again more thoroughly. I'm not sure if I'll do that mm. anytime soon, um, but. I dipped into him briefly when I was in Colombia. I was in Colombia very around the time that he died. 
and so there was quite a big mm. celebration uh, of his life and so I remember um, uh, getting into him then but only really kind of um, again maybe like Virginia Woolf it wasn't the right time when I first encountered it and then this, yeah. this time around with Love in a Time of Cholera it just clicked and um, you know if I didn't have other shit going on I'd be in a Marquez moment for sure yeah but yeah. I wouldn't mind going back to Colombia and reading him in you know <laughs> in, in in the setting in northern Colombia on the Caribbean that would be quite nice I wouldn't would be say lovely. no to that would be very nice no yeah but that was our audio I feel like we're on the same page I mean we've had a few similar connections yeah. yeah exactly some of them are the same let me ask you what are you reading this week or listening is either or I just started reading so I'm not that far into it uh, Northanger Abbey by oh. Jane Austen wonderful um, unfortunately I can't tell you much about it I'm only about 40 pages in I think it's about 250 and so far it's progressing very much like every other novel in that sort of time period um Catherine Morland has moved to Bath for the season and she's going to some dances. Um, but I know that's not what the story's about. According to the blurb, she she meets these, uh, these twins and sort of mentally descends into this imaginative state of of, of being crazy and thinking all these crimes have happened so it sounds like it becomes quite a dark story and I think I'm just on the prep on the precipice of that happening um, but unfortunately I can't tell you much more than that because I have not read the book yet that's interesting I've never um, I love Jane Austen but I've never read Northanger Abbey the only thing I know about Northanger Abbey is that I'm pretty sure it's one of if not the earliest uh, literary or written reference of cricket Oh. Um, or perhaps, a, or maybe the first mention of the LBW rule or something. Oh, like maybe we mentioned earlier. Something like that. It's got something to do with a very, I mean, it seems a bit late in the day to be a, a reference. Cricket seems a lot mm. older than that. But um, yeah, I mean, keep it, an it, eye it, out for it. It's not, I guess, one of her greatest hits or known as one of her greatest hits. It's not mm. in the kind of three or four in that the, I've yeah. read. So, um, mm. but I mean, if if you. Um, if you like it, I think I might have to jump into it because I could be in a very Austin mood. I think I I'll have to wait till the end to to let you know. All right. Well, let me know. Let the listeners know. I'm sure there's yeah. th- thousands of them waiting with bated breath as yeah. we speak. Millions, millions, millions. Quite right. I mean, billions. Yeah. Who knows? Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, I uh, this week I felt I wouldn't say bad, but. For those who listened to a recent episode, we uh, were on the same page in panning Leo Tolstoy's Anna Karenina. Correct. I thought that, you know, there are people whose opinions and sensibilities I respect who are great admirers of Tolstoy, and but they are particularly admirers of War and Peace. I don't have time to read War and Peace right now. I'm a bit busy. And so I thought I would give a novella probably his most famous novella ago which is the death of ivan illich or ivan illich 1886 mm. um and unfortunately i liked it about as much as i liked anna karenina <laughs> ah, how good so i guess it's just a matter of preference uh i prefer prose which is kind of densely populated with with brilliance and uh, rather than buffeted by brilliance, which is how I feel Tolstoy. You know, he's got good mm. stuff at the beginning and good stuff at the end, and then there's a whole Siberia in the middle, which pff, just page after page of blank white, and I'm not seeing yep. much. And I think he takes a lot of liberties. Um, you know, again, Ivan Illich starts with a bunch of flashes. It starts with the death of Ivan Illich, uh, and there's uh, some brilliantly observational moments of in an open casket funeral, and then he goes back mm. and tells the life of of Ivan Illich. Um, and it's a pretty standard life of a guy who, you know, plays by the rules, goes up the hierarchy in the kind of, as a, a civil servant, becomes a, a judge or something, um, you know, earns the right money and sits in the right circles and, you know, mm-hmm. all that, but unhappily married and all this kind of stuff. 
and then kind of uh, contracts a kind of uh, illness, a bit mysterious, begins to die, and then on his deathbed confronts his own existence uh, and discovers that he's wasted his life, which is, of course, a very noble literary trope and, you know, maybe a tall story if he was really starting the ball rolling there, thanks. But if you're going to do that, I think you kind of need to show that the life the person wasted was worth would have been worth it if they'd lived it to the full. Mm. And Ivan Illich does yep. not sound like he would have offered much of anything to anyone. I didn't yep. really get that sense. I, I feel like he did well with his life, if anything. Um, mm. And that I didn't, yeah, I wasn't really brought into him. A bit like a lot of the characters in Anna Karenina, I was just like, man, you're boring. I don't really know. It's not, not boding well for War and Peace then. Yeah, I mean, everyone goes on about War and Peace, so maybe one day. But maybe I should just fucking... Learn my lesson. It's not my shit. It's happy for other people to like it. Yeah. Even at the length of a novella. And I don't know. Mm, mm. It's like 120 pages or something. Yep. Um, it was... Uh, I forced it down. Yep. And... Yeah. I feel that, you know, it has a morbid flourish at the end. And a few nice lines at the beginning. And then... I don't know. You have to trudge your way through deep snow for the rest of it. And yeah, yeah. so not my cup of tea, but, uh, you know, I think it was his first, uh, publication after his, uh, infamous, um, I guess you'd call it coming to the faith or, you know, re evangelization or, you know, where he mm, became mm. uber religious late in life. Um, yep. So there's a lot of those kind of concerns going on, uh, but yeah, to me, it 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 um, a lot of hot air, and didn't, that's a shame. Yeah, but whatever's uh, we know we're on the same page with that. So mission accomplished yeah. for us. Yeah, I'm not going to read it now. <laughs> yeah, don't bother. <laughs> he can stay dead, as far as I'm concerned. <laughs> Well, as always, thanks for tuning in to On The Same Page. Like and subscribe. Shoot us an email. Like us on Instagram. I don't know. Do whatever. Mm -hmm. You guys, get out there and read some books, listen to some books, and uh, more importantly, listen to your old pals, Seamus and Blake. Until next time. Woo.